Welcome back, everybody. We are now ready to get on with the next session. So the next panel discussion will be focusing on a cybersecurity investment footprint in Malaysia. Moderating at this session is Anwar Yusuf, the head of industry engagement and collaboration for cybersecurity Malaysia. Over to you, Anwar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. A very good morning. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful day. It's raining, you know, a little bit difficult waking up in the morning, I guess. And uh, thank you for everybody to be here. Thank you to MDAC for inviting us. And uh, I think we're going to have uh, quite an interesting discussion. Uh, how do we look into the cybersecurity investment in Malaysia? Uh, just, just to set the tone a little bit, uh, uh, we are proud that uh, I think about two weeks ago, the Global Cybersecurity Index that is issued by uh, ITU, uh, position Malaysia at number five. Uh, not bad, I guess, you know, we had about 98% ranking in terms of the technical uh, organizational leaders uh, and, and uh, international engagement. So I, I guess uh, in terms of overall, when we look at cybersecurity in Malaysia, uh, we are pretty well off. Uh, we have cybersecurity in Malaysia that looks on the technical aspect. Uh, we have NAXA, which is the National Cybersecurity Agency. And of course, on top of that, we also have Multimedia Commission. All right. So now having said that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, my three uh, panelists here and uh, allow me uh, in, in reading their profile. Okay. So uh, first of all, welcome to Mr. Sai Siddharth, who is the Managing Director for Malaysia for Trovicor Technology. Uh, Sai has more than 18 years of experience in software development and digital transformation. And yes, he is currently the managing director for uh, Trovicor Technology, which uh, do development for intelligence, I guess. Yeah. So uh, they are basically leaders in uh, lawful interception and intelligence solutions for law enforcement and government. So if anybody have any questions about Pegasus and uh, what the... Israeli company NSO is doing, he is the right guy to talk about it, okay? So uh, he, he played a key role in transitioning the development centers uh, of Trovaikov from Croatia to Kuala Lumpur. And he is supporting the uh, two key product lines, okay? So definitely he is the guy to talk to, you know, why he chose Malaysia. And uh, before joining uh, Trovaikov, Sai was the chief technology officer for SeaWorks. Uh, where he headed the software delivery to customers to more than 100 countries. And uh, he had a short uh, stint as an entrepreneur developing uh, software development in Indonesia and Malaysia. And of course, Sai is uh, part of our talent expert network in MDEC. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, my old friend, Barry Johnson, uh, wish that one of these days, you know, we can get on our bikes together, but I guess I stopped that. Yeah? Okay. Barry is the country manager for BAE Applied Systems. More than 30 years of experience in national security, intelligence, and defense industry, okay? Barry has delivered major programs in the areas of future electronic warfare, communication intelligence, signal intelligence, and uh, supporting to military operations. And of course, uh, it, when it comes to secure network infrastructures, cyber defense, and multiple sources of information, uh, security exploitation. Barry has been in Kuala Lumpur for the last six years and joined BAE in 2004. After more than six, 15 years as a career with the UK Intelligence Agency. Okay. Uh, my third uh, distinguished panelist is Michael Burney from British Petroleum. Uh, Michael is the information security principal. Mike is in the information, uh, sorry, Mike is the information security principal for customer and products business at British Petroleum, including uh, regional accountabilities for SPEC. Of course, he is based in Kuala Lumpur and has 18 years of experience in delivering IT solutions, including major ERP de deployments globally. <coughs> uh, and of course, recently he has led BP's identity and access management transformation program before moving into his current role. And now he is basically responsible for partnering with the customer and product business units globally to identify and of course to mitigate cyber risk from a system supplier and cyber behaviors perspective. 
So uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, if uh, we could start here. Of course, my first question is, uh, uh, I think we will go with uh, uh, Sai first. Sai, you, you brought the business over from Croatia to Malaysia. So what, what was the criteria? I mean, what were you looking at uh, other than just, you know, uh, the beautiful weather and the food that we have in Malaysia? What were your criteria? And, uh, sure, and, uh, thanks for that uh, great introduction. Uh, but before I dive uh, deep into why Malaysia, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, the past and present teams from MDAC on their 25th anniversary. Uh, you know, they have done a truly wonderful job. And in fact, they were pivotal to our decision to set up shop here in Malaysia. And um, yeah, as, as you mentioned earlier on, you know, Tropical Technology, we started off in 2017 as an offshore development center for the Tropical Group. Um, Tropico itself, we have roots in German engineering, uh, but along the way, we always had an offshore development center as such. But the development center itself was a, uh, always located in Europe, right? But what happened was, you know, we, it was escalating costs, as usual, uh, one of the key factors for us to move on somewhere else. Uh, but also there was these rumors of new um, and stricter, tighter export regulations coming in uh, coming up in Europe, yeah. So we wanted to preempt that from affecting us. So we decided to find a new development center outside of that continent. And of course, uh, Asia would have been, is the first choice. And, uh, you know, and when you look at the options around, you would look at, uh, I think, India, Indonesia, Singapore, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, yeah, in no particular order. And Malaysia just simply ticked a lot of boxes for us, right? You know, uh, when we look at it, uh, we look at fix, fiscal options, you know, uh, being a MSE, status company, uh, it gave us this tax exemption, which meant that our costs were lower. And that was a big plus point for us. Um, the ease of doing business here, you know, I think statistically we are ranked uh, number two in ASEAN. And, you know, even worldwide, I think according to ATQ, um, this was statistics, uh, Prior to 2016, 2016, 2017, I think we were ranked number three, yeah. So that was great. That was one of the great factors. And, and you know, um, the conditions that we had to meet to gain all of this tax exemptions and all that were well within our uh, budget, so to speak. Yeah. I think when you look at our conditions that we had to meet or uh, stipulated, um, you know, we had to set up a 5,500 square feet office which perfectly fitted to you know, the number of developers that we wanted to hire here in Malaysia. Uh, we had to invest, I think, a certain amount of capital uh, into Malaysia, which again, I think we invested five times more than what was required. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, last but uh, not least, I think it's just the overall cost of establishing a business was just so much cheaper um, than in many of the other countries uh, that were in our list. All right, but what uh, you know really nailed us down to Malaysia was the location, right? Because you know when you look at our industry, let's say um, it's not easy to find talents in just one particular country. You know we have to cast our net uh, worldwide. Yeah, so that meant that we had to hire uh, not just hire new, uh, but we also had to bring some of our developers from uh, from Europe and uh, from from Asia and so on. And uh, it had to be attractive enough for them to relocate. Yeah. And here is where, you know, I think Malaysia just, okay, I'm biased because I'm Malaysian, but uh, I think Malaysia beats the rest of the countries in Kinaas. Yeah. yeah. Because when you, when we came down here, to, I mean, when, when the actual stakeholders came down to Malaysia, we were shown this cyber cities, yeah, or cyber centers. And, uh, you know, when we looked at the UA corporate tower, where we are located right now, you can see that it just provides all the infrastructure for us, uh, you know, as a business, as well as the necessary support systems for our uh, uh, employees to come in, or you know, future employees, expectations to come in, right? You're looking at the area, you see, you know, uh, uh, there's a wide variety of choices for accommodation, right? Uh, irrespective of budgets, right? That even if you don't want to stay in the area, there are two MRT lines coming into our location. That makes a lot of sense for the Malaysians that we are hiring. Right. And you know, the other stuff like international schools, uh, food 
you know, there's so many options around our area, right? And for a business, you know, uh, sorry, for a business, but for, for them, uh, Malaysia, I think, was ranked, uh, and please don't quote me at this, I think we were 160 something out of 290, 209 countries in the world uh, in terms of affordability of, of, of living, yeah, ranked from, from you know, the lowest high. So we were very good in that sense. Yeah. So it was just uh, such an easy decision to make, you know, everybody was excited to come here for our business, you know, um, Sorry, you wanted to say something, Anu? No, no, I, I think you are biased because you're just Malaysian. <laughs> but I think, you know, my, my colleagues in the panel, I'm sure, sure. they're waiting to say their opinion as well. Uh, yeah. But just to add on, I think one of the other reasons that we wanted to be here is because, you know, it, it gave us uh, an opportunity to be with a lot of other high-tech companies, yeah? This clustering, you know? You know, you look around our, our, our office area itself, we have Alibaba, Swift, Orange, yeah. many other companies in the telecommunication space. We thought that we could tap into, into what they are doing. Um, and, and, you know, I think it was really something really good for us to, to do. It was a wise decision. I, I can talk if, about if it. I, if, I, if you look at it, even your neighbor is BAE just across the road, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, I, I think BAE is located a little bit further away. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's right. good to have, to have yeah. around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Thank um, you. If, if it's okay, Barry, uh, if you could share with us, what were the key decisions? Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to say I was involved with BAE in the early days, but uh, please share with us what were the main criteria that BAE decided to, to have uh, operation investment in Malaysia. Over to you, Barry. Okay, thank you, Amma, and uh, thank you for your kind introduction earlier uh, as well. Um, I think actually many, many of the reasons, many, much of the rationale is very similar to Sai. <clears throat> so we were going through a process of um, trying to reduce uh, our delivery costs uh, in the UK. And uh, based on that, we decided to opt for uh, a series of engineering centres. We set some up in the UK, we set one up in uh, Poland. Um, but we thought really we need something that's much more uh, international suited to the, uh, the kind of broader market. So. Again, looked at many options, uh, very similar, uh, same sort of countries, uh, Indonesia, India, uh, Philippines, etc. Uh, but I think the, all the primary reasons uh, we, we looked at Malaysia was actually from a BA systems group perspective, we actually have a very long history here. So we've been delivering defense programs in Malaysia for over 40 years now, uh, the aircraft and the ships, etc. Um, but uh, that, that familiarity was a great help in making a decision. Uh, but also the fact that um, you know, English is very well spoken in Malaysia. Uh, that's a very powerful thing for, for an international company. Uh, of course, tax incentives. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much to MDEC for, for helping and supporting us through that. And we're on this kind of five plus five MSC um, status. Um, so financially, uh, it, it made a lot of sense. Um, but I think in addition to some of the things I was saying, actually the law uh, was quite important to us. So the law in Malaysia is very aligned to the UK law. So from a commercial standpoint, we kind of we were very comfortable. Uh, we know where, where we sit and how, how things would pan out if anything did go wrong. Um, um, maybe not... <laughs> Uh, political stability uh, was another one, so you can take <laughs> you can take a guess or, or, take that. <laughs> or how, you, how you take that off today. But that, that's not true actually, because I think what's going on now is is, is you know, that happens uh, all, all over. But I think more in the terms of uh, there's not going to be like a major coup. Uh, there's not going to be you know radical changes that completely right. impact your business. So you know that kind of political stability uh, it is good as well. But I think the key when we get down to the, some of the key nuggets that really really swing it. Um, so um, the education and skills base in Malaysia. So we've got really good access uh, to quality uh, graduates. Okay, and that's that's what we wanted to do. So we want to build an engineering centre. Uh, we want the skills, and we want to grow from the base up. Uh, the time zone. I think, sorry, Amor, are you going to say? No, no, no. no. I, I I think it's 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 all there. All the boxes are being ticked here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the time zone, I think Sai mentioned as well. So for us, that, that's a perfect kind of follow the sun model. So um, as um, kind of Malaysia finishes, the UK picks up and vice versa. So we've got that kind of 24 hour coverage. So if we, if we were running things like managed security services for cyber, et cetera, which we, which we were back in the day, then that, that's important. Um, and of course the food, <laughs> food and the weather and the beaches, et cetera. So it's a popular place for people to visit. Um, so that was all the, the kind of main uh, positive reasons that, that we uh, 
you know, wanted to invest in Malaysia. But I think uh, there was also a little act of fate uh, at the same time. So we were expanding into Australia as part of our international growth and strategy to expand into Australia. And we did that through acquisition. So we bought a company over there. And as it turned out, they happened to have a legal entity already established in Malaysia. So that made uh, you know, the setup of the business and starting things up, it made that a lot more simple for us as well. Um, so that was quite a positive. Yeah. So I think that's probably, probably yeah, that was back in 2012. So quite, quite a while back now. Um, and I think that business we inherited had something like 12 people. Uh, we initially grew that to 30 when we set up our new office, et cetera. Uh, and now we're over 350 staff here. So it's quite a, quite a gross story over the, the kind of last nine years, I think. And, uh, you know, we, we had less of the issues, I think, that Cy had in terms of moving expats around. We did that as a very early thing to set, set up the business. But now, you know, we're, we're, we're almost, um, you know, I think it's about 80% of local Malaysians, the rest are regional resources. I think I'm one of the three or four now that <laughs> are still here who are, who are expats, and that's purely because of my understanding of the the, the kind of the market in the UK actually, yeah. and the kind of some of the customers we serve there. So um, the, there's no other reason for that. So you know the management team here now are all Malaysian, etc. So we've done a full business transition uh, to, to a local organisation, which which was relatively painless actually. It's been it's been quite a journey and quite exciting growth. Yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm happy to say I've been part of that uh, growth as well, you know, right from the early yeah. days when uh, it was just Stratsec, yeah, uh, Peter right. Lilly and Doug Stewart and all of them. It's, it's been great. It's been great working with uh, BAE, you know, I mean, over the years, looking forward for what's going to be happening next. Except that I, I can't say where I'll be going, you know, next two years, <laughs> I'll be <Okay>. retired. <laughs> all, right. all right. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank That's you. great, man. Um, Mike, uh, of course, BP BP has been in Malaysia for many years. Okay, so what well, what is your opinion, bro? Well, what do you think that you know, it's it's the key thing that we should be doing in Malaysia, you know, to keep on getting more investments. Yeah, and and I think we were at a similar sort of juncture with with, with Barry and Sid. You know, we, we had to make a decision to lower our cost profile. Um, we already had the business in in Malaysia with Castrol and. Uh, the retail fuel stations, which sadly have gone. Um, not many people who work for us remember those, but because um, we've got quite a young workforce, but um, uh, yeah, we were at that juncture and we had a GBS centre, we're, we're in a similar place, we were trying to establish that. And, and so the GBS centre actually came first um, and that just added to the sort of um, criteria if, if they were you know, locating in, in Malaysia, then it made sense for the IE delivery center, IT delivery center to, to sort of co-locate to, to leap off that. But, you know, for us in, in, in the IT space and, and the cyber security space, coming into, into Malaysia had a lot of benefits for us. Um, a lot of them have already been talked to, obviously the, the, the tax incentives. Um, and one, one of the things, you know, we had to establish a workforce pretty quick that could prove themselves globally because we were gonna, we support the whole of BP, not just in the right. region. Um, so there was a lot, a bit of pushback originally, but the fact we could quickly bring foreign talent in um, with the work permit support through, through MDEC um, and also then just tapping into great talent in country as well. So, um, you know, we, we were able to um, quickly establish a, a strong team um, made up of, you know, people from outside, but a lot of experienced um, Malaysians as well who'd work at consultancies and for MNCs. Um, and then, you know, from a resourcing point of view, the the, the kind of uh, coating on the top of that was the great graduates. And, and in the past year, we've really ramped up our graduate program. Um, and it's really impressive, the, the kind of quality of, of graduates. And, and we're seeing some of the ones who've come in in the last five years now leading teams, global teams from, from KL, which is, you know, a, a testament to, to, to the quality there as well. Um, so, so, yeah, and, and you know, the, the guys have touched on it. It was very easy to get um, expats down here to, to uh, sometimes too easy. And we had to push back on the number of travel. Luckily, well, one, one good thing about COVID is that's kind of uh, stopped, but, uh, <laughs> um, they're, they're, you know, people love to work in Malaysia. The people are, are very accommodating, the food and, and obviously the uh, infrastructure and, and the accommodation as well. So so I think it's pretty similar story to, to what Sid and Barry laid out. Yeah. Sure. 
Thank you. Well, uh, I mean, if there's one thing that I could share, and and yes, you know, I'm biased being Malaysian, uh, but having been uh, in cybersecurity Malaysia for the last 12 years, uh, I've seen the government changing, you know, from before Barisan National, then to Pakatan Harapan, to now here. Uh, yes, there's been a lot of political changes, but touch wood, you know, thank God, uh, the people on the street are fairly stable, you know, I mean, you, you don't see... Of course, you're going to see, you know, I mean, a thousand guys here, a thousand guys there. But there has not been any violent or brutal uh, things happening on the street. So, touch, touch wood, you know, hopefully we, we retain this kind of peace and stability. But other than this, you know, uh, and, and I think, Mike, you touched on the people part. Uh, it, were there any specific challenges that you faced that maybe, you know, you would like to... Uh, address uh, whether it was retaining the talent because I know being fresh graduates, I'm sure you hired them. They are smart, they are good, they are ambitious. But after three years, four years, boom, you know they leave. Uh, what what would be the challenges that you are facing then? Yeah, it's great, great, great question. Um, key challenge is exactly that. You know, we, we build the guys up and their capability, and then they they they've got you know a market that the, the that is out there and and quite a strong market as well. Right. Um, one of one of the things that we we had to do was allow flexibility, right? And um, you know, the, the, as I said our team in, in Malaysia support globally. So, so it's not practical for people to be in the office nine, nine to five um, and you know, wait for the boss to go home before they go home. So we had to sort of drive that culture and that, that worked to our benefit because you know, people coming into the organization really appreciate that. Um, women who've got kids to, to, to look after, they, they can go home, they can do their calls after the kids are in bed that kind of thing. So, so that um, was a great sort of um, advantage in retaining talent. And, and you know, our, our retention rates are pretty high and, and they have been consistently um, because of this. And then just just when, when COVID obviously came in and we got to that, it wasn't a huge, you know, shift for the, for the mindset in the IT organization in KL because we were pretty much operating remotely for a lot of our days in the week anyway so um yeah that that was sort of um it, it was something we had to do to to kind of you know operate successfully out of malaysia but it also helped in retaining the talent as well yeah so uh, that, that was an issue that we faced you know i mean being a government organization uh, we've been telling our uh, management of course uh, hr look we, you need to start looking into work from home and all that stuff. That was before COVID. And, you know, the answer is, no, 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 we are government and this and that. So when, when COVID hit us, that was a big shift. You know, it was like, uh, like wow, you know, how, how, how do you really do Zoom or Microsoft Teams and all that stuff? So uh, maybe, Barry, you, you have more than 350 people. And I guess everybody comes to office and, you know, you have to be there before the boss, like what Mike said, and you cannot leave before the boss leaves. <laughs> so how, how, how is the culture in BAE then? Right? So, so, so culturally, actually, uh, we're, we're quite different to that. So we, we've always had a degree of flexibility. So um, if we step back and think, you know, kind of what our UK business looks like, uh, it, it's very heavily uh, consulting based as well. And a lot of that is on client sites. And a lot of that is uh, in, in other people's offices, not even in your own office. So we built up that culture of home working. Um, so you go to a client site, you'll go home, you'll do some work afterwards. So um, that, that culture has been established. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of flexibility. We do have uh, kind of structured and formal flexible working programs and providing you just agree that with, with, with your manager, you, you can work the hours you need to get your work done. And, and you know, that's well accepted and quite normal for us. Uh, I think COVID was um, a different phenomenon, if you like, because even though we had that culture and we did predominantly work in the office, okay, except, you know, maybe for the kind of salespeople, support staff who were out. Um, but when COVID came, uh, I think either somebody had excellent insight or we got a little bit fortunate. You can, you can make <laughs> your own decision. But uh, we had literally in uh, about the February of 2020, we did a business continuity exercise the same right. So what would happen to a, an, an engineering center if people couldn't go into the office? OK, so we had the infrastructure in place for home working and everyone's got their laptops and things like this. Um, but we actually tested it, can you believe, one month 
before we all got locked down. So how lucky was that? Or good foresight, depends. Um, and we had a realisation, actually, because we didn't do much in the way of homework in, in Malaysia, that although the infrastructure was there, it couldn't support everybody. Um, so um, and that exercise is also valuable as well in terms of there are some things you can't do from home. So things like we have a common criteria lab, um, there's an evidential trail you've got to maintain, and that, that's centred around a, a lab. So how are these things going to work? Uh, and through the good graces of uh, MIT, um, you know, we are established as one of the uh, companies that needs to carry on operating during lockdown. So although if you go to our office, it's almost deserted for those essential staff who need to get in, uh, we can still do that. Um, so some support staff, things like, um, you know, uh, access to secure labs, secure facilities and things like that can carry on. So, uh, but, but culturally, um, uh, and going forward, we're, we're seeing this as a uh, as an opportunity rather than uh, a setback, uh, because now people have worked from home. They can understand some of the benefits, but also some of the challenges. So it's not so great sitting in traffic for an hour, trying try to go three kilometers in KL. <laughs> um, and, and so your day is extended if you're working from home, but also there are challenges, there are distractions, there are people around there, and trying to find your own space even can be difficult. So it's, it's a mixed bag. So we're gonna to move to a, to a hybrid model. Um, we're actually gonna allow our staff agree uh, personal terms, if you like, for themselves as to how much they work at home, uh, how much you work in the office. So, uh, so culturally we're, we're we're okay with that. We're okay to deal with that. And obviously there are, there, there are broader challenges and making sure people don't get isolated and things like that. But, but we're doing this globally. So there, there's a whole team, uh, you know, based in the UK, looking at what will work, what won't work, and making sure individuals don't get left behind. I understand. I think it's more about the deliverables, you know, what we're going to be expecting from our staff. Uh, but for all guys like me, you know, I, I have a problem sitting at home. And the wife will be coming and say, uh, can you go take the cat litter out? Can yeah. you go ahead? She's like, can yeah. you drive me here? So I say, okay, okay. Uh, I'm, 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 not, I'm not that kind of guy. I mean, uh, it's, it's difficult for me to sit at home. Yeah. And uh, it's, you know, your mind is just not there. Uh, Sai, you there, brother? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now, what about your, your organization, bro? How do you handle these challenges? You know, all this work from home. What are the challenges that you've been facing uh, with, with your operations in Malaysia here? You know, for us, um, we're very lucky that we have a supportive team. We have a, all have, hats off to them. You know, they, We had some issues during the early stages of the pandemic, you know, uh, took some financial decisions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that meant that, uh, you know, it impacted a lot of our staff, but they were all supportive. And, uh, you know, they, they took it on the chin and they continued giving their 100% to us. Okay. Um, so that's, that's very much appreciated. Uh, but we turned around very quickly, yeah, um, and that was great. Um, when it comes to this working from home and all that, you know, um, unfortunately, we didn't have the hindsight of what uh, Barry was just explaining. With BAE, you know, it just happened and uh, we had to quickly go into this remote mode. And, uh, you know, for me, for example, I live in Sri Lanka, and uh, believe it or not, I didn't have broadband connection until I think uh, mid of last year. Uh, yeah, so uh, the first three or four months was very challenging, uh, you know, communicating to the uh, customers, communicating to our other stars by a uh, very poor uh, internet line. Uh, but yeah, but I think, you know, the good thing is our, our owners were flexible. Uh, you know, we, we quickly invested into, uh, into our IT setup, you know, we got everything uh, sorted out in a way that uh, it wouldn't hamper our delivery anymore. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I think it, it just doesn't run away far from what other companies have, have been doing as well. There's nothing special that I can add on to this. Uh, I, I guess maybe I, I could uh, share one of the questions that we have from our listeners. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I, I'll, I'll start with you, Sai, if you don't mind. Sure. What, what, what do you think, uh, probably, you know, like, like your organization, uh, Tro Y Corp, uh, mm -hmm. over the long-term landscape, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the foreign investment, especially, mm -hmm. you know, now that we are having this, uh, I, I, I think this pandemic is probably going to go on. Yeah. I don't know. Hopefully, you know, uh, maybe it's uh, next year, if not, you know. Uh, what, 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 what is the overall opinion of foreign investment uh, during this crisis as well as, you know, I think we spoke about that political situation as well. 
Uh, what are your views and, and what do you think that, you know, uh, overall your opinion will be on this? Sure. I think for the countries that have already entered Malaysia, for example, like Tropical, we will, we will definitely continue investing in the country. All right. The base is established. Mm -hmm. uh, we gone through all the hassles of, of doing that. And, uh, you know, the pandemic will throw a spanner, you know, maybe, maybe when you look at investment, what we would have planned for, say, something in, in five years time. Uh, you would take a back seat there, you know, uh, it's just natural for us to do that. Uh, personally, for us also, you know, um, instead of going gung-ho and, and developing new things, uh, we would perhaps look to see and partner and not reinvent the wheel, right? Uh, internally, we are looking at, say, you know, some modernization projects where we don't have to hire too many new people, uh, you know, with the existing team itself, we're able to do that. And, uh, you know, thankfully, we have uh, some innovation coming up, some POCs coming up, and we look to expand and, and, and some new products that we want to push into the governments, right? But when you look at people from outside, I think maybe in my personal opinion, uh, you know, with the travel restrictions and all that, perhaps they will, they will not look at moving right now. Right. Uh, but of course, the plans will be in place, right? You, you know, for you to set up a company in Malaysia, it's, it's very easy, but I'm sure it'll take two, three months. And I think when, when you look at your plan, if you, I think we can estimate or guesstimate that maybe the borders will be open sometime in January, 2022, once everybody's vaccinated and all that. I think if you start now, uh, you're in a good seat to you know really come in. Perhaps another way of looking at it is for people in the cybersecurity industry who want to uh, come into Malaysia, perhaps, you know, just uh, some takeovers or, you know, buying into some other companies. That would make more sense, right? Uh, you would have an established uh, entity in Malaysia. You know, you have the resources there, and, and they're basically not run a business. Mm -hmm. I think that that's where we were looking at for, for Malaysian companies. I think it's if you are looking for investors, you already have a base set up. I think it would be a great time to right. push it through. So, so coming coming on on that aspect, uh, Mike, uh, if I, I would like to share this because BP has been around here for a long time, uh, but cybersecurity is fairly new now. Would you think that, you know, I mean, th there is no way BP and BAE is going to leave Malaysia. I cross my fingers, right? Okay. The <laughs> cost of investment is just too much. Okay. Now, now, would it make sense, okay? Would it make sense for, for us, like I think Sai mentioned just now, that maybe we should establish a technology hub, uh, a cybersecurity hub, an innovation center, so that we can attract more investment, more companies. What, what, what is your take on this? You know, how, how would you feel about it? Yeah, no, I, I think you, you, you've sort of identified a real opportunity for, for Malaysia. Um, you know, if I look at BP internally and what we're doing around digital security, we're moving a lot of activity to this part of the world or, or at least replicating what we, we've historically had elsewhere. One minute. MDAC, yeah, yeah. take note of this. Yeah, make sure you record this, man. <laughs> Yeah, carry on, Mike. Carry on, Mike. Sorry. No, no. Um, yeah, you could get that plug in. Um, so, so essentially, you know, there's a lot of things happening here. From here, we can uh, support what our activities in China, our businesses in China, and, and it's a great place to, to locate for that aspect. And sometimes being outside of China is, is advantageous as well. Um, so so we, we're located here. We're close to Australia as well, where we've got a lot of our retail business. Um, and then Castrol is, is pretty, um, you know, widespread in ASPAC. So, um, you know, the, 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 the CISO across BP Group has made a conscious decision to build out the capability here and part of my me getting this this role has, has been that and, and we're bringing in you know cyber incident management teams in, into into the KL office and and just building the technical capabilities as well so if there was a a pool that we can pull on you know um down the road uh, that de definitely uh, opportunity I think yeah yeah thank you thank you Barry what's your opinion I I mean put it this way you know I I, I personally feel because we have just moved over to Cyber Jaya in 2019. And, and I, I mean, I, I, I love this new office here and I love just being around with all these technologies, uh, MDEC, MCMC and all the other companies. But one thing is missing in Cyber Jaya. You know, I mean, we don't have a cybersecurity park, a cybersecurity hub. Barry, I would like to listen from you, bro. What do you think, man? Yeah, it, it's interesting, isn't it? And, um... Like you say, the, the, the people we chose, you know, we were leading our business set up here um, back in the day, chose a KLCC centre for us. So we spent a lot of our time now going up and down 
to cyber giant to put a giant yeah. uh, because we, we work with government. So I think you know, from, from our perspective, the you know longer term, uh you obviously got leases and that longer term we may look uh at other areas uh to do business. Uh I think it's you know especially now, you know, in, in terms of expats. We, we left that behind. They all like the, the bright lights of the city. It's so unique. Uh, but, um, you know, now, now we're established. You know, I think we can look at that in the longer term plan. In terms of innovation centers and cyber technology hubs, um, it is always great to be able to, to understand what's going on, uh, to understand different organizations' views, uh, where they're looking to, uh, uh, to go forward. Um, and I think that would be a great help. And I think... I think for us, maybe um, if, to, to attract uh, further and future investment and get new new investment, which is probably very important to, to, to Malaysia. Uh, obviously, you've got to look at the market here as well. And I think this is uh, it's like a really good time uh, for, for, for Malaysia, if you, particularly in cyber. So if I focus just on cyber. So um, you think you've got things like the MCSS has been launched. So you've got a five-year strategy and a five-year plan. So there's something you can... Uh, you know, uh, put some investment behind uh, the, the 5G rollout is going to happen. It's going right. to be, you know, 5G is a great benefit. I think um, everybody just sees 5G as, uh, oh, it's just another increase in speed. Well, it, they're going to get a shock. Cause it's something that's actually fundamentally different uh, to how you do networking. Um, so there's going to be lots of new opportunity on the back of that. And there's going to be lots of um, cybersecurity requirements. Uh, and actually for ourselves and our um, Trevor Gore as well, there's, the, there's going to be challenges for the law enforcement agencies. So there's a different market opening up there. So when we kind of look at what is actually happening in Malaysia, there, there's a, you know, there are good opportunities. And obviously MDEC themselves um, leading on, on digital transformation. So um, I think for companies looking to invest in Malaysia, now is actually a very good time. Uh, however, the, the pandemic will possibly get in the way. So um, it, it's, it's going to be a little bit knife edge because um, governments can't stop because of COVID. You need to carry on. Um, so you just got to be very careful of not missing that boat and getting your timing right. So I, I, do, I do think we, we can use initiatives from MDEC at the moment, et cetera. Yeah, the, the timing feels right. Um, as long as you don't try and nick any of our staff, that's one of the challenges we have. So that's... <laughs> um, uh, you know, the graduate community is very strong, uh, but actually trying to get senior and qualified cyber professionals is much more difficult. Correct. Um, so we take our grads on a journey. Um, a lot of the work they do is actually uh, for overseas clients. Yeah. And the regulation there is uh, more senior, uh, is more strict. So they demand that the staff have things like CREST certification and other yeah. cyber certification. So we've taken our grads on that journey, got them professionalized. Um, and now that, that maturity is happening in Malaysia, so things like RMIT and the MCSS. Um, so those, those skills are now more in demand. So the... There is a lot going on, I believe, and feel now uh, in Malaysia in the, in the cyberspace, cyber community, and certainly somewhere to corral that around an innovation and skills centre. I think the skills is probably key to you know, that capacity building. There is an opportunity there. So if you can get foreign investment to come in and build that capacity, which is kind of some of the things we've been doing, uh, I think that represents a great opportunity for CSM, for MDEC, for other organisations as well. I guess that that's, that's the way that, I mean, uh, even like for us at Cybersecurity Malaysia, uh, we'll be coming up with a small program to take in 200 uh, unemployed graduates right. or retrenched workers. This is part of our Formule and Cyber Casa program. So when, when we launched the program, uh, of course, we put in the ads in social media and everything. We had more than 400 uh, applicants, but a majority of them are unemployed graduates. So right. it seems like, you know, when it comes to retrenched workers on IT, it's almost none. It's it's you know it's uh, it's something that I, I think is is kind of okay not, not bad you know it's it's uh, good because the IT workers are still in demand. So I, I totally agree with you, Barry. You know I mean we need to look into the matured workers. How do we retain the mature workers? How yeah. do we keep them on? Of course, bringing in the graduates is only one part of the story. Is keeping the uh, matured workers now. Coming back to some of the challenges, all right. Um, one of the things that is lacking in Malaysia is a specific regulation on cybersecurity. 
Yes, we have our Communications and Multimedia Act. We have our Computer Crime Act. Uh, and you know all the but what we are lacking here is a specific regulation on cyber security do you think that it is time that the government should start looking into this would would having a specific law assist in the investment um, can i can i start with you Barry? this this is a topic that is personal to us i guess yeah what what what's here you know sorry i'm just really trying to unmute yeah. sorry yeah. <laughs> um so I actually think these things are happening. It just takes time. Yeah. So yeah. the the the, yeah, the Malaysia cybersecurity strategy has all those things in there. Yeah. So they they are looking at increased regulation. Um, they are looking at changing the law. I think there's somewhere I can't remember the maths. Twenty eight to thirty two different laws that you can be prosecuted on for some kind of cyber event. Um, so. It, it, it's broad and confused, but it's difficult um, yeah. because by the time you've uh, assessed what your law should be, the technology has yeah. moved on and how people abuse it has moved on. So it's very difficult. Um, but I think in, in in general, I think the delivery of the, of the cyber security strategy, uh, it probably is critical to investment because that will drive up those levels of regulation. Uh, it will drive a new legal framework yeah. and that you know and those two things will drive the need uh, for cyber skills because yeah a, a, as we know both know with you know, kind of practical terms there's still too many companies that kind of just tick the box for cyber security uh, and and there's no real uh, massive comeback on them uh, so strengthening the the kind of repercussions of having weak cyber security uh, it is it is part of that you know maturation uh, of a strategy, uh, and that then drives the demand for for the better skills, and, and just you know drives the market. So it's good. Yeah, I, I guess uh, basically that is covered both in the MCSS Malaysia Cybersecurity Strategy, as well as the Bank Negara RMIT. Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah. So it is covered there. Uh, Mike, if you if you do uh, share with us. What about the geopolitics that is happening around Malaysia? I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting to see what is going on uh, in China, uh, in, in Indonesia. What, what is the overall BP's view? I mean, of course, I'm looking at the perspective of overall investment, not just in cybersecurity, but possibly, you know, um, in, in the whole infrastructure as well. What, what, what would be the view of BP uh, for this interesting development when it comes to this geopolitics in our region here? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're already invested, as you probably know, in Indonesia with Tangu LNG, and, and we've also got investments in, in China, and we've got, you know, partnerships with uh, companies in, in China as well around EV charging and things like that as we move into the new future future mobility thing. So we, we have to, you know, be very cognizant of, of the geopolitical situation, because then how that manifests itself is in changes to the cyber laws and regulation. And, and we have to react to that as well in, in China. Um, you know, there's three laws now that my team are working to make sure that we comply with, and it changes on a weekly basis almost. Um, yeah. India as well is bringing a new uh, PII uh, regulation that we need to react to. Um, so, so in in our particular space in cybersecurity, we, we're very busy trying to align to these new regulations. From a sort of wider BP context, we are pushing our net zero agenda. So we are looking at new partnerships in, in those areas and not the traditional, you know, um, uh, fuel products where we're looking at EV charging in in these parts of the world so but it we will have to be cautious depending on the partners and and their relationships with their governments and and just you know maybe just just be a bit cautious in, in the current climate um but it is in our agenda to push push forward in sort of the alternative energy space in in, in these parts of the world yeah 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 i think that's that's definitely going to be one of the key things you know as we move from hydrocarbon to electric cars to autonomous there's definitely going to be a lot of new challenges sai are you here brother of course yeah mm. what what's what's your future man what's your take bro how do we move forward uh what what i mean if let's say tomorrow you have an opportunity either to meet up the pm or meet uh mr azmin what would be your sir this is what you need to do man I think for us, you know, companies like this, we're, we're not as big as, of course, BP or sure. BAE. Uh, but for us, I think it's important to have stable policies. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, what what drove us here. Mm-hmm. Those policies, if it's if it's not changing too much, would be great for us. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. What has changed? Uh, you know, for example, now it's difficult for us to hire uh, talent uh, if the expatriates. Right? It's a good thing that Malaysia is doing. Yeah. The uh, Malaysia first policy is something that I also would support. Yeah. Uh, but suddenly, you know, we found that it changed. Uh, not overnight, but you know, they gave us a month or two to do that. Yeah. And uh, what happened is, it was difficult for us to actually hire people quickly. Okay. Yeah. And you look at the investors coming into Malaysia; it's all about cost versus productivity, yes. right? And uh, you know, if it takes us long to fill up a position, it means our product will not get rolled out. It, it, it's longer for our customer to receive that, and it hits our bottom line, right? So I think these policy changes, if they engaged. You know the industry players. I think it's not just small companies like this, but perhaps yeah. you know the bigger players like like my uh, in the panel as well. I think they would agree with this. Um, if they, you know, if we have a say in that, yeah. and if MDAC or Cybersecurity Malaysia end you know, up being part of government organizations, they can champion our cause. Yes. Then you know that would be great. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I think you know what is what uh, Miti itself. Uh, you know they've they've got this national investment. Aspiration, the NIA, and I think uh, MDAC is also doing their digital investments future. I think it bodes very well for the cybersecurity industry, you know, because you look at the, uh, the industries that are coming up, ag tech, health tech, you know, in fintech and so on. Yeah. Uh, cybersecurity is industry agnostic, right? And they will have a part to play in, in all of these layers, right? And I'm sure the companies which are going into this, they don't want to develop new things. They will look for consultants. They will look for partners. And, and you know, it's, it's just a huge opportunity, right? It, it's going to be a big pie. And the pie will be big enough for a lot of new players in the cyber industry market. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And uh, I think that that is one of the key things when we look at the... Uh, policies uh, should not be changing. But I, I guess so far, uh, one of the key challenges has always been on uh, hiring, okay? Um, it's it's always there, you know, I mean, you, you need to balance between local talent and bringing in expatriates. So I, I guess that will be one part. But other than that, I think uh, personally, having been, uh, overall, it, it's not been too bad. I guess it's been fairly stable. The only main issue has been on the talent part. Um, that will be, I think, the next session. Barry, uh, just one last, last question. Same same thing as what I was telling Sai. Uh, assuming you have five minutes with my minister, Sai Fudin, bro, what are you going to tell him? Eh? Wow. And, and I can arrange that. Huh? I can arrange oh. that. Not an issue, man. If you want to meet him, man. Okay. I, yeah. I, I probably would say was there's been a lot of work going on uh, to develop strategies, to yeah. develop uh, things like the digital transformation programs uh, and things like that. Uh, don't, don't lose the uh, momentum is probably yeah. what I would say to him. So right. this is all coming together and there's been a lot of organizations for a lot of time and effort in, yeah. and now you need to implement. Okay, so that is don't, don't lose that momentum. Is probably what I would say. Otherwise, you'll you'll end up in three years' time. So we need to write the next cybersecurity strategy that's going to drive innovation, going to drive investment, next digital transformation, and you'll be broadly repeating what you've done. So it, it, it is a case now of you've done all the hard work now. Now implement, you know. So I think that's probably what I would suggest. Just 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 to share a little bit, uh, cybersecurity Malaysia will be signing an MOU with uh, Cisco tomorrow afternoon. Right. And uh, it is going to be witnessed by both my minister, Saifuddin, as well as the American ambassador, uh, Brian McFeeters. So this is something that we are really looking forward to. So we are, we are definitely on investment yeah. Yeah, because we believe this is, uh, this is the way. I mean, there is no such thing as cybersecurity is only within the, our own locality, sovereignty and all that. But we definitely need the team. Uh, Mike, you are nodding your head, sir. Want to share? Uh, what what will be your elevator pitch to the minister? Yeah, I, I think 
drawing on, on Barry and Sid's bit, stability in terms of the, the policies and environment that we're working in um, obviously helps. And then, you know, not losing all the good work that's been done and to start sort of pushing it forward, I think. So, yeah, I mean, I would just echo Barry and Sid on that. But uh, I think stability is really important and confidence that, uh, you know, if this is a strategic hub for us, that it's safe for BP, for example, or any company to invest and, and make it that, yeah. I have a question from the audience for you, Mike. Uh, if you could bear with me here. How would you create your organizational cybersecurity roadmap? Is it investment driven by the compliance regulation or is it more driven by the cybersecurity risk that you are facing? So uh, you get the question, right? Yep, yep, yeah, yep. yeah. I, th I think the two are related. I think it's cybersecurity risk, definitely. But yeah. in that is is risk that we don't comply, right? Okay. So 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 I think it's kind of what are our biggest risks, and and, and that would drive our, our kind of resource profile and capability we need, and and that risk view is 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 geopolitical and regional right so where are our biggest risks and and, and start to, to to look at those areas and what is the particular risk and obviously ransomware is is quite prevalent right now and we're driving a lot around behaviors um driving the behaviors uh, piece as, as as kind of one of our mitigation so a lot of our investment is is driven you know uh from a risk mitigation approach yeah, yeah. all right so it's basically a mix of both yeah yeah um, okay now um barry this is for you, brother. How fast will you be able to adopt 5G technology in your company? And, you know, estimate how much increase in productivity or efficiency would you think you'll be able to gain from this 5G? Because I guess um, this is where the experience comes in. Yeah, yeah well, I think, I think the nature of our business, uh, it's... Uh, is not going to be a driving force for us uh, because we're not in manufacturing, we're not in production, um, but you know, our, our ability uh, to operate uh, could change. Um, yeah, again, home working, things like that, mobile would be great. But I think, I think for us, it, it, uh, it's the other side of the coin. So it's how do we help? Uh, we, you know, we, we do lots of big data, we do lots of law enforcement. So how do we help um, those organisations adapt to what they can do so uh and how do you secure their environments which is probably the other way around so um you know we we, we were the first company and no offense to tropical we were the first company in the world to, to deploy a standards based law and law, lawful intercept solution and you know it, it is a game changer so um you know with, with 5g become comes lots of opportunity but also lots of risk so um and, that, and that's where we focus so it's those those users using 5G will be there to support them. So rather than us using 5G to drive efficiencies in our own business. Yeah, I think so. Okay, uh, Sai, if you could uh, share with us, you know, I mean, typically organizations are all facing threats and definitely like in your uh, situation as a software developer as well, the threats are changing. But I, I mean, it's, it's more of what is the current situation and how do you as a developer react to this in terms of your product development? I mean, that's a tough question. <laughs> no, really. Um, but if I got it right, uh, you know, what you want to know is how we react and uh, perhaps secure our product. Yeah. Right. You know, I think in, in our industry, it's, it's, it's thankfully we have a certain number of standards sure. that we need to follow, like CISO and all that. You know, as long as we need those kind of uh, tough regulatory standards, then, uh, then uh, we can definitely say that we comply and, and our customers are happy with it, right? Uh, but other than that, you know, I think our industry is a little bit different from your typical uh, software houses or software uh, deployments mm -hmm. in the sense that most of our installations are really in an island. Mm -hmm. So we are very lucky that there's not uh, a possible threat as such that, that hits this kind of locations, yeah, yeah. so to speak. Uh, yeah, that would be my take on it. Uh, sure, sure, of course. I mean, it's, it's definitely a different ball game altogether because your market segment is more on the law enforcement. That's right. And that's right. the threats, yeah. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, I think I would like to go around. Uh, Barry, would you have any last minute um, thoughts, uh, any suggestions that you would like to share with the audience? Uh, oh, wow, that's tough, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I, I don't think I do. I think it's been a good session now. And thank you very much for the opportunity. I think that there, there's been some good uh, subject matters um, discussed. Uh, I think there are a lot of very powerful initiatives uh, around cybersecurity in Malaysia at the moment and digital economy investment. And it, it does feel uh, like a very good time to be here if that's the industry you're in. Uh, and, and, you know, potentially a very good time as well. Because cybersecurity is going to cut across uh, every aspect of the digital economy, um, you know, from devices you use in your own home to, to the devices you use in government and the complex ways to defend. So um, it's, for me, it's quite clear there's going to be considerable growth in the cybersecurity market in Malaysia. So from an investment perspective, like you said earlier, we're certainly not going anywhere. Uh, but I think what we do expect to see uh, would be you know, other British, other international companies coming into this market uh, to, to actually see. So, so I think even our own focus uh, may shift more from doing international business from Malaysia to doing more business in Malaysia. And yeah. uh, we, we need a bit of, you know, uh, there, there are challenges with that of uh, being a, a non boomy country company, but, um, you know, there are, we need to we need the team, we need to find partners, etc. So it, it, I feel it feels like a very good positive time to be an exciting time to be in Malaysia. Totally, totally agree. In fact, uh, the meeting that I had earlier was our so-called internal cybersecurity Malaysia commercial development committee, and we are also looking at opportunities within the region. For example, working mm -hmm. with Indonesia, uh, BSSN, uh, working right. with yeah. Brunei, and all that. So I guess yeah, I mean to 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 an extent. Uh, Hopefully, you know, Malaysia is, is at the right uh, center so that, you know, it's easy for us to do business within this region. Uh, thank you. Mike, uh, any last uh, comments, last uh, ideas, suggestions that you would like to share with us? Uh, first of all, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And it's been a really great in se session, very informative. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think, you know, the bad guys are getting more sophisticated. So uh, we need to up our game and, and having a great talent pool to, to, to pull on and support from MDEC and things is, is something that we, you know, we want to keep connected with. And, and um, yeah, definitely it's a growth area for us, digital security in this, in this part of the world. And uh, KL is our strategic hub at the moment for it so um yeah uh, look forward to staying connected definitely i think that is coming in from the user perspective because i guess most of the time the interaction that i have yeah with you know with the suppliers with the providers people like barry bae and others and i think coming in from bp side and and looking at you know what what the great work that you have done here that's fabulous i i do hope you know we will have the opportunity to sit down physically have coffee tea we, we have some fantastic new uh, facilities in our new building but unfortunately it's all closed Sai, i have a lot of uh, tools that i would love to share with you for example we have our common criteria lab we have our FIPS lab what 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 do you think is the future together for us here man please share with me for a few minutes you know, like like i said you know for us we're just not looking to to reinvent the wheel yeah. And uh, it's, you know, this session itself is a great opportunity to, to have a chance to meet uh, all three of you. And, uh, you know, I'm just looking at and seeing what else that you can offer sure. to us to, 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 you know, to offer to our customers, right? We would like to piggyback on that, you know. Um, but in the end, I also would like to, to end my, uh, my session with saying uh, something for the investors who are looking to come into Malaysia. Right. Uh, you know, Provico may not be yeah, we are not a unicorn. We are not as large as the other companies. Yeah, but uh, you know we do develop highly sophisticated software, highly resilient software, high-performing software, and we do it from Malaysia. Yeah, I think the proof is in the pudding. And Tropico has done a very good job uh, using engineers in Malaysia. The talent is here. The ecosystem is here. You know we are very well supported by the government. Yeah. So if you're a if you're an investor looking to invest in Malaysia, now is the time. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, Sai. Uh, again, like I said, you know, uh, we do have facilities in cybersecurity Malaysia to do uh, product testing, uh, common criteria, FIPS, and all that. Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a great session. Uh, I wish we had a little bit more time. There are other areas that I would like to go deeper in. There are some questions about Pegasus, but I think this is not the right forum, okay? There are questions about ransomware. I guess, you know, we, we should keep that in maybe in another technology session. Um, Thank you, Sai. Thank you so much. Love to see that, you know, uh, you are in Malaysia. Uh, Mike, 
hope that you know we could catch up soon. I I never met you, bro. Uh, yeah. You know, hopefully, we can have coffee tea in my office here. Yeah. Very bro. lovely to 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 have you again here. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like Very to much. pass back to Mdeck and uh, stay safe, guys. Be good. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Anwar, and to all the panel members, and well, Sai, Barry, uh, Michael, for your inputs on uh, cybersecurity investment here in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you again. Bye, guys. We will now be moving forward to our final session for this first half of the day. It will begin very shortly. So do click join session and complete the survey for each of the session as we strive to continuously serve you better. Okay. See you in a bit.